Hello everyone and welcome to this month's webinar. Today I've got the heading there is um, <clears throat> want to reduce your tax but today's all about family trusts. Uh, I want to ex explain to people what a family trust is and, and how you can use those ultimately to reduce taxes. A few other things we'll talk about but that's what we're going to be uh, spending most of the time uh, talking about today. So I think we'll get started. We've got a, a Good number of people uh, attending today but uh, as as always we'll be recording this webinar and uh, putting on our website and uh, actually uh, a good point there we've actually got a brand new website I think it's going live about um, Tuesday or Wednesday this week some new uh, new uh, features to it including all our past webinars and things like that so uh, uh, check that out if you can so moving along uh, there's me again uh, a new picture of me for those who uh, who have been watching our webinars over the past. Uh, that's me, Derek Nolan. I'm the uh, owner of 12 Chart Accountants. So uh, if you're not familiar with me, that's a, a fairly uh, recent photo. Okay, let's move on. So what we're going to talk about today in this webinar, firstly is what is a trust? Now, I must say it is quite a difficult thing to explain to people who don't uh, don't know. Um, what one is and uh, trying to explain um, how it works is quite difficult but I'll have a go at that today. Uh, secondly what we're going to talk about is the different types of trusts. There's a few we'll mention today. There's actually quite a number of trusts but really they're just, they're, they come down to about two or three basic types uh, with different uh, fancy names. We'll go through those briefly. Third thing is we'll talk about um, what the beneficiaries are and who they are. It's really important we get that uh, uh, clear definition of uh, people know, particularly when we start talking about the family trust and who the potential beneficiaries can be. Uh, then we'll talk about the advantages of having a family trust. Um, and, and with those advantages, there's going to be a few things we'll talk about. Just brief is going to be on asset protection. Um, it's sort of a mechanism to pass on family assets to future generations. And thirdly is it reduces your tax. That's where we'll spend most of today talking about because that's the, the stuff that I, I like doing is how to reduce some tax. And lastly is should you have a family trust? So those people listening out there today have probably got um, various reasons. Some of you might even uh, consider having a family trust or, be, or, or, or been told that you should have one. We'll, um, we'll sort of um, run through a few things at the end to see whether you actually should have one. Okay, let's get started. Um, what is a trust? Okay, so there's plenty of definitions out there. The one I like is basically a trust holds assets on behalf of someone else. Okay, does a trust actually exist? Well, it probably doesn't, um, but we'll go through um, what it actually form it, it has. It's like a parent holding money for a child. For, so imagine that you, you have a child and you've got money um, that belongs to the child, they inherited or it's their own money, but you have it in a bank account and you control it, you, you, you look after it, you hold it. You understand it's not your money though. So that's a good way to, to describe it, like the parent holding money for a child. Now in that case the parent um, is the trustee. I'll explain what the trustee does and everything a little bit later on. And the child is the beneficiary. Um, it's very common actually for the trustee to be a company. I'll go through the reasons for that in, in later on, but the main reasons for that is because of mainly better asset protection. Um, and secondly, the companies don't die. So this trustee, which is the, the important part, which that's the, the entity or the, the person that's um, holding the money, there's a few issues that happen when that person actually dies um, where companies don't. We'll get to that in a second. Okay, so they're the, they're the main things. Um, what sort of talks about trust? Um, really, a trust is very similar to a company. Now, a lot of people um, probably watching this webinar know what a company is, and if they're running a business, they're probably running it through a company, so they understand what that concept is. Um, so, in a way, a trust is very similar to a company. Uh, you can set it up just to simply hold assets um, or you can actually set up to conduct your business through. 
uh, either way. Now, normally if you if you um, have a company, you very rarely set a company up just to hold assets. It's really done to conduct a business, but a trust can be used for both. Uh, my business here is actually run through a family trust. So we'll get to that uh, later on. There's a few main differences between a trust and a company. Uh, the first of these is, firstly, it's a little bit more expensive to set it up. And we'll go through a bit of a diagram later, but with a company, you just go to ASIC, pay your um, you know, filing fees, uh, maybe $1,000 something, and set it up, and off you go. But with a trust, it's a little bit more complicated. You need a trust deed, you need um, um, the trustee, you need a few other documents um, to set it up. So it's a little bit more expensive. Maybe you're looking at maybe um, $2,000 or something like that. Plus there's obviously ongoing fees, um, accounting legal fees, uh, which are a little bit more expensive uh, as well. Assets generally in a company um, is not a good idea. So if you're running a business in a company, you try not to keep assets in your operating company because if you get sued, um, obviously all the assets of that company are able to be taken by the creditors. So ideally, um, uh, if you have a company, you don't have assets in it. Where trust can generally can be a trust that just owns assets. So therefore, it's a little bit better for um, asset protection. A couple other things that um, separates a trust from a company is uh, trusts can't accumulate profits. Um, and therefore they don't pay tax. It must distribute the profit. So if you have a company and it makes a uh, $100,000 profit for the year, it can actually keep that profit and pay tax on it. Say the tax rates are 30%, they pay $30,000 and you're left over with that $70,000 which accumulates in the company. Where a trust is completely different. If it makes a $100,000 profit for the year, it must distribute all those profits if it does, and it's very rare that this happens, if it does accumulate those profits, it actually pays 46.5% tax on that profit. So that's why it'll never happen. Um, that's one of the main differences. Um, the other good, important thing to know is if you do have capital gains tax, and everyone is probably aware that if you own an asset for more than 12 months uh, as a personal, as an individual, you only pay capital gains tax on half the profit. You get a 50% capital gains tax discount. Companies don't get that. So if you own an asset, shares, property, or anything like that inside of a company, and you sell it for a profit, you pay tax on the full amount in companies. Where trusts, because they don't pay tax themselves, they need to distribute the profit. So if there's a capital gains there, that capital gains will be distributed to one of the beneficiaries could be a person, and then that person then gets the 50% um, capital gains tax discount. Really important to know that. Okay, <clears throat> different types of trusts. We'll just rip through this um, fairly quickly because I want to get into the, the juicy stuff, which is later on on how to how to save some tax. Uh, unit trusts are a very popular type of trust. Um, again, the difference there is a unit trust. Um, it's like a company, it specifically divides the ownership of the trust into units or shares. So if you've got a company and there's um, four shareholders and each person has 25% shareholding, well you know where you stand, you own a quarter of that company. Same with a unit trust, if there's um, a unit trust and there's been four units issued in that unit trust, which are exactly the same as owning shares, well, you own one quarter of all the assets of that um, trust. And more importantly, you're, um, you're going to receive a quarter of the income. So it's, it's much easier to understand and conceptualize that you, what you own and what you're going to get um, as your income, uh, which can, differs a lot from what we could talk about in a second is the family or the discretionary trust in that the property um, is held by the trust um, on behalf of all the unit, of all the shareholders or the beneficiaries. What you're entitled to though is completely at the discretion of the, um, the trustee. So that's the big difference. I'm not going to spend any more time on unit trust, uh, fairly straightforward concept and uh, we'll move on to the other things. Um, discretionary trust now, um, 
what we'll be talking about, the, the, the term family trust and discretionary trust are very interchangeable. Discretionary trust is really what, uh, what they are, um, meaning that the, the ownership and also the income is at the discretion of the trustees. The word family trust has sort of become um, synonymous with a discretionary trust because that's what most people set up um, for a family. Um, and I'll go through, the. there is a small difference between that's to do with this family trust election and things like that. Um, but there's, mostly it's interchangeable between a discretionary trust and a family trust. So again, the important things there is the income and the capital gains uh, will be distributed at the trustee's discretion. Now, like I said before, it's like the parent and the child. The trustee is the parent, the person controlling it. In a lot of cases, it'll be um, the, the main person, the key person. In my situation, I'm, I guess, the key person. Um, but at the end of the day, most of it comes down to what your accountant's going to say. Is this is the way it's going to be distributed, Derek, and um, because it's the tax, the tax side of it. But it comes down to the trustee's discretion on how they do it. The, the main reason you do this, of course, is trying to spread the tax um, burden around. Uh, you're looking for people in lower marginal tax rates uh, for reducing tax. Now, I'm going to spend a lot more time on this uh, later on, so I'm not going to uh, spend any more time on it now, but they're the main things. Another thing that's worth mentioning just today is another type of trust is a testamentary trust. Not very many people have heard about this, but the main thing there, a testamentary trust is established according to someone's instructions in a will. Okay, So therefore, a testamentary trust doesn't exist until someone dies. Really important um, that that's um, known. Um, so what someone might do is they, they, they'll pass away and they say, listen, I don't want to give it directly to people. I want to put into a trust, a testamentary trust, to be used for something education of the grandchildren or, or something like that. Um, so again, same thing, someone has been then elected as the trustee, they're going to control all the money on behalf of who the beneficiaries are. They might like in, it could be the grandchildren or something like that. So these testamentary trusts are set up um, for that particular cause. Um, and then the, the money is used in accordance with what the person who passed away's rules are. The great thing about testamentary trusts is that uh, when I get to the tax treatment of a normal discretionary or family trust um, in a minute, is that children under the age of 18, they can't get much in the way of um, trust distributions before they pay a very high tax rate on it. However, money that comes um, to a minor under the age of 18 from a testamentary trust is taxed as if they're an adult. This is a fantastic thing, particularly for us accountants. We get very excited about these sort of testamentary trusts um, because you can really save a lot of tax. Um, if you have a situation where you, um, you're looking at doing a will, um, testamentary trusts are really good to, um, to consider and, uh, and talk to me about if, you, if you're interested. Okay, I'm going to move on now. Um, to talk about the, the general types of trust. Now, these are the, the important things. So what a trust is, um, it's a, a difficult concept to understand because it doesn't actually exist in common law. It's really just a trust deed where you, it's an arrangement or an agreement between, like I said, the trustee, the parent, and the beneficiaries, the child. And this document, this deed, is just setting up the terms and conditions on how the assets are going to be looked after and how the income is going to be distributed. It's just a trust deed. It doesn't actually exist. So what happens is you need to have a trustee who's in charge of all this. Like I said, the parent. Um, now, a lot of situations, the, comp the, the trustee is a company and I'll explain um, a little bit later why you do that. It's mainly for asset protection purposes. Um, and uh, that's the real person, the real entity. It's either a company or an individual person. That's where the real person uh, exists. Now, like I said, if there is a company as the trustee, in most cases there is, uh, a real person is uh, a director of that company. Um, then down the uh, bottom of the trust, you've got this, all the beneficiaries. 
And I'll go through all how they work in a minute, but they're, they're the key elements of a trust. So when you when you start talking to someone about beneficiaries and the trust and the trustee and the director of the trust, they're how it sort of works, okay? Now, whether that's a unit trust, a testamentary trust, a family trust or a discretionary trust, it's pretty much all the same, okay? The difference would be where the beneficiaries are, if it's a unit trust, each of those beneficiaries down here would have a certain number of units. So it might be 10 units, 10 units, 15 units, 30 units. So therefore, the ownership is actually uh, determined by the, those units. When normally for a, a testamentary trust or a, um, a family trust, um, the, the beneficiaries, are, it's all determined by the trustee. Okay, uh, moving along is we've got a family trust and its beneficiaries. Now this is really important to understand um, because when you start looking about tax planning, you say, well, who have we got that we can share the love with? Who can we share the profits with and the tax and all that sort of stuff? So you start making a list of who you can use. That's normally my first question is, who have we got this year? Um, so it's important to know that. So normally you need to know who the key persons are. Now, these people are normally named or identified in the trust deed. And it's normally the person who's going to be the controlling person in my situation, the Nolan Family Trust. I'm the key person, okay? And I'm specifically named in the trust deed, okay? Once that's been established, the spouse of the key person is a potential beneficiary. Okay, now a lot of these people may not be specifically named in the trustee, but by common law and tax uh, law, um, they're beneficiaries. There's the parent, the grandparents, brothers or sisters of the key person is also a potential beneficiary. Okay, the children, Nieces or nephews of the key person is also a potential beneficiary. And the spouse of anyone mentioned above is also a beneficiary. So as you can see, it becomes very much a family group. So if you have a small family, you have very um, limited number of um, beneficiaries. If you've got a large family, well, the, the, you get pretty excited as an accountant because there's lots of people you can uh, share the love around. Um, but as you can see, it becomes, um, I'm not going to go in today about what a family trust election is because it's a little bit complicated, but just basically saying once you've got a family trust, these are the people that are potentially a beneficiary for you. The other important thing is that any entity which is a company or trusts of anyone mentioned above. So anyone, you know, parents, grandparents, brothers, sisters, niece, nephews, spouses of all those people. Now, if they have a company that they own 100%, those entities are also a potential beneficiary as well. Now, that's really good to know if you've got a, a sister or a brother who has got a company that they might run as a business that's got losses in it. Very, very exciting when that happens, okay? Okay, so I just, that's the, the definition of what a, a family trust beneficiary is. Really important that you get that and uh, people understand um, who you can sort of pass the money around to for tax purposes. Okay, the advantages of a family trust, I think we mentioned them all before, is one is asset protection. Uh, I'll go through that in a sec um, on how that actually works. Secondly, is that there's a, a way of passing on assets to future generations. And thirdly, is reducing income tax. Um, I also made a little mention there, reduces capital gains tax, but I've already mentioned that anyhow, in that, um, that the capital gains tax can flow to the beneficiaries um, and they get to get the 50% discount if it's available to them. So what I'm gonna do is briefly, those, um, those main items there I'm gonna go through now and talk about um, for items one and two very, very briefly, because we've already 
touched on a few of them anyhow, but the main area we're going to talk about today is how it reduces your income tax, because that's one of the, the main reasons people have family trusts, okay? So with an asset um, protection, this is how um, uh, a lot of trusts are set up. Now I'm going to use my own as an example, so the Nolan Family Trust. So if you've um, received an invoice from me, <clears throat> from any work, you probably even noticed on there, um, it actually came from the Nolan Family Trust, trading as 12 chartered accounts, okay? The trustee of my trust is called tw is 12 Proprietor Limited, which is a company, registered with ASIC. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I am the sole director of that company. So the ACN and all the operating entity is within the, the Nolan Family Trust. Um, 12 Proprietary Limited, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is just a um, a trustee company which doesn't do anything. It doesn't have an ABN, doesn't have a tax file number, uh, it just sits there to make decisions and look after the assets like the parent. Now my beneficiaries um, is my wife. Um, uh, Anita, I've got my niece thrown in there because she's over the age of 18, which is which is great. I've got um, my children, William and Richard. Um, I haven't listed anyone else there, but you get the, the 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 gist of what I'm talking about. So that's my structure there. My operating entity is the Nolan Family Trust. That's who employs people. That's who has the rent. That who has um, the income. Everything operates inside the Family Trust. At the end of the day, I have a profit, hopefully and I make my um, uh, distributions to beneficiary. Now, obviously, I personally uh, is also uh, a beneficiary. Okay, now how does asset protection work though? Well, there's two situations where this is really important. Now, a lot of people only ever talk about one, but um, there is actually two, so I'm gonna throw both of them out there. The first one is, what happens if the Nolan Family Trust, the trading entity, 12 chartered accountants get sued by anyone? Um, what happens to the assets? Well, like I said before, the assets of the trust um, can be taken by the creditors. So if I owe money to, I don't know, say the tax office or something like that, they can come and take assets of the Nolan Family Trust. Now, I'm a little bit clever. There's not many assets inside the Nolan Family Trust. There might be a couple of computers, um, a calculator, and um, I don't know, a couple of desks not much at all. So if anyone wanted to sue the Nolan Family Trust, that's all they'll get, and a couple of dollars in the bank. Um, um, what actually happens though is the other, everyone else is safe because the trustee, 12 Proprietor Limited, that's where if you trying to sue the Nolan Family Trust and there's no assets there, all you can then is to try and sue the trustee company or the trustee. And that's why you have a company, you don't have yourself as a personal um, trustee. Now, 12 Proprietor Limited doesn't even have any assets. I think it's got $1 to its name um, because there's one share issued for $1. Again, that's anyone suing the Nolan Family Trust then goes to 12 Proprietor Limited as the trustee. There's no assets there as well. And that's as far as they can go. They can't go to the beneficiaries, they can't go to the directors of the trustee company, unless there's negligence and all that sort of stuff. But in most circumstances, that's where it finishes. All the beneficiaries, the directors of the trustee company, they're all safe. How good's that? And that's what we're talking about, asset protection. So my asset, my house, um, my car, everything else um, can't be touched by anyone who uh, is trying to sue the Nolan Family Trust. Now obviously, if you're a sole trader or someone like that, well, all bets are off and um, whatever you have as uh, assets can be sued, as, uh, taken from you. The other way it works, also oh, just protect, bit yourself there, so it can protect your personal assets of individuals in the event of the business going bankrupt. The other way with this really important is, the, is, is another way of asset protection. So here we are with the same situation, the Nolan Family Trust, you've got the 12 proprietors limited as the trustee and myself as the director and all the beneficiaries. But say for example, something happened to me personally, okay, and I personally get sued. Um, there's multiple reasons um, that could happen. And this could not just be me, it can also be um, one of the beneficiaries as well. So. That's not a good thing, particularly um, if you're um, if you're the director of the trustee company. 
But what it does, it actually works the other way though. Because my personal affairs, um, I can only be sued uh, for my personal assets. Now, I've made a few other things um, uh, in place, so I actually own a very, very, very small uh, amount of my house, my, my wife owns most of it, and all those other things. Um, but my business won't be affected. It continues to trade, continue to um, to operate without um, without my, uh, being affected by the owner being personally sued. So that can actually um, happen as well. So it can protect the family group of assets from the liability of one or more of the family members becoming bankrupt. That actually works. I haven't done the diagram where, say, one of the beneficiaries, uh, Erin, for example. Um, also becomes um, bankrupt or personally sued, I, I would actually um, move those out and uh, make everything else um, safe as well. Okay, that's what asset protection is all about, but you need to have that company in there as the trustee. You can't be an individual as the trustee. Okay, uh, moving on, we've got this mechanism to, fa to pass family assets to future generations. That's a really good advantage as well. Again, I'll quickly show how that works, is you've got the trust assets. Um, the normal thing, you've got the proprietary limited trustee and you've got myself as the director. And you've got the beneficiaries, okay? So same as before. Now what would happen if something, I die, for example, okay? So there I am, I've disappeared. So all trustee companies though need to have a director, at least one. Um, because trustees companies don't make decisions themselves, they need the directors to do that. But say I passed away, uh, what easily happens though is that um, my wife then can take up the position as the director of the trustee company and life moves on. Nothing else happened, the, the, the trust um, assets remain the same, the trustee company, which I explained before, doesn't die. Uh, Everything remains the same, but a new director just takes my place. It could have been William or Richard if they were old enough. Um, life just moves on. So therefore, the assets that are, are there inside the trust, particularly if it's a non-operating entity. I, earlier on I described a, a family trust can do two things. One, it can just have assets. It could be um, cash, it could be shares, it could be a number of things. Um, that just generates income. Or it could be an operating entity like the Nolan Family Trust operating as 12 chartered accountants. It can actually do both things. Um, so if it is one, the, the, the first one where it's actually building up assets and there could be um, shares, it could be property, it could be a number of things inside that trust. The pain is always when the, the, like the, the parents die. What happens then? Well, there's a whole capital gains issues, um, um, things need to be sold, and it just becomes really messy. Lawyers love it, of course, um, but if you've got this situation here, um, all that happens is the, the, the trustee company doesn't die and the new directors are appointed. It's very, very simple. There's a few stamp duty issues you need to, to worry about, um, but basically the business structure can remain the same, um, but if there's a change in shareholder and director, the trustee um, the ownership can be passed to the next generation. So it's a very, very simple thing. There is um, some stamp duty issues, okay? Now, we're getting into the, the juicy stuff now. This is, this is why most people have a family trust, to reduce tax. Now, what I'm gonna explain here, hopefully is very simple. I always try to dis describe the, the way you reduce tax is like a jug. At the end of the year, um, you've got a profit. So um, whether it's a, a, a trust that has just income from shares or, or cash or whatever, it uh, doesn't matter. Um, or in my situation, it's the Nolan Family Trust. At the end of the day, I've got my, you know, my, my rent and my income, my wages and all the other things. But at the end of the day, I've got a profit. And for this example, I'm going to have $115,000 profit for the year. Now, it's like having a jug, and now, now my, that looks a bit like a jug. Um, so imagine your jug with $115,000 in it. Now what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to try and spread that income around to everyone in the family. So I go back to that list of beneficiaries. Now what I've got my first focus on is the tax 
um, free thresholds. Now for adults over the age of 18, you can earn up to $18,200 and it's tax free. Now unfortunately children under the, under, under the age of 18 can only earn $416 worth of passive income. Now they can work. They can go and work at McDonald's and earn more than that and pay tax at the normal rates. But we're just talking about passive income, interest, um, distributions from family trusts, all that sort of stuff. So the tax office put a real clamp on the amount they get. A few years ago, they used to be able to get a lot more than that. So anyhow, um, that's what I'm looking at first. Okay. So so I've got this jug of cash in my hand, and on the table in front of me, I've got all these other glasses. Okay, they look like little jugs, but glasses. Now, in those glasses, all my family have got money already they've earned. Okay, so in this situation, Emma has already earned five hundred dollars. Peter's earned three hundred dollars. Aaron's earned fifteen thousand three hundred eighty dollars. Matt's earned twenty-five thousand dollars, and so on. So everyone's already earned a little bit. Okay, so what I'm trying to do now is. With the blessing of all these people, now it gets a little bit complicated because you know um, trying to explain to Emma that she's going to earn more money um, for tax purposes is a little bit tricky. But anyhow, we'll get to that in a sec. So what I'm looking at is that hang on, I can pay Emma some more income. So what I'm looking at, I do a quick calculation and I say, well, she's already earned five hundred dollars. I can pay her or distribute to her seventeen thousand. $700. Now that brings her up to $18,200, which is the tax free amount. Okay, so I do that. And my jug falls to $107,300. Okay, so I go to the next person, Peter, who's earned $300. Now I've worked out that I can now distribute to him $70,900, which brings him up to the $18,200 tax free. And my amount of the jug now drops to $89,400. Move on to the next person, Erin, who's already earned $15,380. So I've worked out that I can pay or distribute to her $2,820, which brings her up to the, the threshold. And my jug drops even further. See what's happening here? I'm just spreading it around. Now, Matt, though, is a different proposition. He's already earned $25,000. So in the first round of distribution, I'm not going to give anything to him because he's already over the $18,200, okay? Next person is Sally. Now, Sally's earned $200 um, from bank interest or something like that. Now, I can only give her um, $216 because the tax-free threshold for passive income for children under the age of 18 is only $416, but still better than nothing, okay? And the same with Max. Um, I can give him $416, and so on I go. Get to Mary, 452, so I'm paying her 17743 and see my jug is just falling, um, I'm down to 48, oh, it's not quite right, $60,000, a little bit of a typo there. But by the time I've passed um, all the people that's on that list there, I've still got $60,000 left. Now, there's no one else, I've checked, and there's no one else in the family that I can give um, money to, so I've still got um, $60,000. Now the great thing is I went from $115,000 down to 60, so that's $55,000 that I've distributed, and guess how much tax I've paid? Zero, zero dollars, okay? Because it's all in the tax-free range for all those people. That's what we're talking about. That's how you reduce tax. That is how you pay a very small amount of tax. Okay, now I've still got $60,000 though, so moving on, um, I look at the next tax thresholds. Now, once someone individually earns over $18,200, the next um, tax threshold kicks in at $37,000. Okay, so between 18,200 and 37, you're paying 19% tax. Now children, unfortunately, once you go over $416, you pay 46.5% tax on passive income. So forget about that, okay. But I'm still looking at that next threshold at 19%. Now in my 
example here, I've still got $60,000 in my jug. Now I look at Emma first, just because she's the first person, and I can pay her $18,200 and only paying 19% tax on it. Again, my jug then has only got 41,200. So I keep looking. Peter's the next person, Erin's the next person. Again, they both get $18,200 each because I'm just using up those thresholds. So once I've done that, I'm down to $3,600. Again, I still go through the list, Matt's the next person. Now, all I've got left in my jug now is $3,600. So I pay that to him, okay? So his income jumps up to $28,600. So I even had room um, up to the next threshold for him. I don't even have to look at um, Mary and Edward because I've used up everything that was in the jug. I'm down to zero now. So if you think about it, um, that other $60,000 then, I've been able to distribute that to family members and only pay 19% tax on it, which is roughly $11,400 in tax. So my $115,000 profit that I had at the beginning, I've only paid $11,400 in tax on it, um, which is less than 10%. Okay, that's what you. That's why you have a family trust. Okay, allows you to spread the love. Now, I didn't make it as complicated as it could be because imagine if Mary has a company that she ran a coffee shop through a few years ago and it's got a um, hundred thousand dollars worth of losses in it. The first $100,000 of that money in the jug went straight to Mary's company, okay, to use up those losses. Now, we might not have done that. We might have actually got rid of the first $55,000 tax-free to everyone else first, and then the next $60,000 went to Mary's company to still leave $40,000 for next year in losses, okay, because losses in companies can be carried forward forever, okay. But I kept it fairly simple here. So anyone listening today, that's what having a family trust is all about, spreading it around. Now, it gets a little bit complicated in that, all right, um, Emma thinks, hang on, I've got um, $36,500 that's going to be shown in my tax return. Now, Emma will go, do I get that? Like I've got my uh, niece, Erin, who I make a distribution to every year. Um, now, if she was clever, she'd be going, uh, Uncle Derek, um, do I get that money? Well, this is where it gets a bit tricky because the tax office believes that yes, they have to. Okay, there needs to be a distribution to that person. Now, I'm the believer as long as the money is shown in their tax return and they pay tax on it, they've received it. But under common law, Erin can come along to me and go, Uncle Derek, I want that money. Okay, so that's why keeping in the family, you really need to know who your family members are. You don't want an Uncle Bob to turn up and go, Derek, I want that money, okay? So you need to sort of know and, and talk to your family, um, particularly if they are sisters and grandparents and all that sort of stuff, particularly, I, I know I've sat down with many people trying to make distributions and it, and grandparents who are getting Centrelink benefits or or sisters who are getting childcare benefits, it all makes it a little bit tricky and they need to be completely on the one, same page, okay? But there's definitely some tax advantages there if you do it right. Okay, so just quickly going through the different tax rates, because that's all you're doing, is that you've got the jug of water or the jug of profits and you're just trying to find a home for it all at the best tax rate. Um, individually. So they're the different tax rates um, for the 2016-17 year. Um, again, we try and target the zero tax rate first and then the 19% uh, tax rate, and then we're going to the 32.5%. So once you get over $37,000, you're paying a bit of tax then. Um, so you try and spread around as much as you can. Now, it all depends on how much you've got in your jug at the start on how much tax you're going to pay. But that example where you pay $11,400 on a $115,000 profit is pretty good, okay. So really quickly, should 
you have a family trust. Well, <laughs> most of the business that I do here um, at 12 Chart Accountants is with small business. And probably off the top of my head, somewhere between 60 and 70% of all the um, clients I deal with have a family trust somewhere in their, in their, in their structure. And the reason for that is to be able to spread the income, okay? Um, so I'm saying it, it, it's probably um, it's probably very advisable, but it doesn't suit everyone, okay? I had someone the other day come in and go, Derek, I need to set up a family trust. And I went, why do you need to set up a family trust, Ben? And he said, oh, because my brother's got one. No other reason, just that his brother had one and he knew that was a good thing. Now I said to him, well, actually, you're a little bit different because the income you earn is from a personal services, so it's something we really can't do for you, okay? But there's a few other things we can look at though. So it doesn't suit everyone. So um, there's a few things there you might have to consider is land tax is a big thing. Um, people like setting up a family trust to buy an investment property. Um, a family trust doesn't work because land tax in New South Wales is payable um, for a family trust from the first dollar, okay? So if you owned it individually, you get the first, like, I think it's about $480,000 with land value tax-free. So you would always try and own land in personal names, not in a family trust, or a unit trust might be better because a unit trust does, as long as the individuals um, haven't used up their land tax thresholds. Again, personal services income, that's when you actually earn money yourself and you're just having to flow it through a family trust or a company. Um, that money still needs to flow to you, okay? You can't distribute money, um, there's certain income that I think I've actually done a, um, my last webinar on contractors, I went through PSI income uh, a lot there. Um, the great thing about a family trust is you own nothing, but when it comes to borrowing money, not good. So you might have, have this business and you have all these assets inside the family trust and you're making all these fantastic um, trust distributions to family members, but then you turn up at the bank to try and borrow some money and they say, what do you own? You own nothing because it's not yours until the trustee makes a distribution to you. So it became very tricky for when you start borrowing money. And the other thing is you you might not own, you own nothing, but you control everything. So there's a fair bit of responsibility. Um, mind you, you get a lot of advice from your accountant um, at the end of the year on where the money should go. Um, and like I said there, it's great for tax, really, really good for tax, but it creates a liability where you, you know, you've made the, the distribution into their glass, um, as far as the tax office is concerned, you got to pay that money, Dunkle Bob. So it does create a little bit of a liability there, uh, which we need to deal with. But there's ways around that. Okay. All right. I'm going to leave it there. Um, as usual, I always go over time because this is a great topic and it's something that I really um, encourage people to look at. Most people, though, come to me and say, Derek, I need a family trust. What they should be saying and going to their own accountant if they if, if, if they do that, is to say, this is my situation, this is what I'd like to achieve, and the bit in between, get some advice on that, because it may not be a family trust. It may be something else, okay? But a family trust is really, really good, particularly for tax purposes, okay? All right, I'm gonna leave it there. Again, if anyone has any questions, email me, info at 12.com.au. Any feedback on today's webinar, uh, like I said, if you missed it, um, it'll be put up on our new website. Um, email to those people that registered that didn't um, uh, watch it today. Pass it on to your friends, pass it on to your colleagues. Hopefully it gave you some information and uh, answered a few of those questions that you may not have um, quite got an answer to before. Okay, uh, give me a call again. Um, there's our new website coming up, I think on Tuesday or Wednesday, very exciting. And um, hope everyone enjoyed uh, today's webinar and thank you for now, goodbye. <laughs>